We're continuing our discussion this morning about race and law enforcement with Sheriff Williams here in Duval County. And Sheriff, you listed the limitations as far as releasing body camera video, even saying that some of the laws surrounding this are a bit antiquated. You know, you have the NAACP asking for something very specific, that the video be released within 48 hours of police shootings. If your hands weren't tied on that, would you support this? So I think you've got to weigh the integrity of these investigations. And what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, we, we owe it to every family involved in these cases to make sure that we get these investigations correct. And when you release video very early in an investigation, um, you taint every single witness that would come forward. Remember, when we, when we are conducting these cases, body camera footage is just one piece of evidence. So it, it can be sometimes very powerful uh, and sometimes not, but it's only one piece of evidence, witness statements, uh, other forensic evidence, things that we gather at the scene, all of that has to piece together. Uh, and, and so the story that we've been told makes sense. All these things cooperate together. And so if we begin to put pieces of that case, be it body camera footage, witness statements, out into the community very early on, everything after that is tainted. So if I have a witness that comes forward and says, I was there, here's what I saw, I can promise you there's an attorney that's going to come forward and say, uh, that witness didn't see anything. They watched footage on television. So, you know, we've got to balance the, again, the integrity with, of the investigation with, you know, uh, being open and transparent with the community. So I believe that, you know, what we've come up with uh, as the state looks now to develop a timetable for release uh, is to give a timetable for how long that investigation is going to take. So we will deliver you know, the facts and evidence to the state attorney's office within 30 days. Uh, she's now working on the timetable for her to complete that criminal investigation. And she'll make that announcement, uh, you know, as soon as they're, they're done with their process. Okay. Uh, sure. And that'll be the point of release for body camera footage. So I think as long as the community knows it's going to be 90 days or 60 days or 120 days, make that promise to the community and then keep that promise. Uh, I think that'll go a long way with at least giving people what the appropriate expectation is for seeing some of this video. And I would say that probably is a start, but let's talk about transparency. You know, in the George Floyd's case, it was not body camera video that sparked this community and got everything going. Right. It was cell phone video. We're in a new world where anyone could be taping something and that information can go viral within minutes. What is the difference, though I understand it's from a, van a different vantage point, that video that goes out for the world to judge versus body camera video that then you all release from the perspective of that police officer? So the difference is uh, the impact on, on the event. So we're responsible for the investigation. Think about the person who catches uh, body cam video. Um, they have no responsibility to do anything with that video. They can do whatever they want with it. Um, we have been uh, the state attorney's office, uh, state attorney elected by the community to do that job. I've been elected by the community to do uh, the job as sheriff. And so we have a responsibility to make sure, again, uh, that we are maintaining the integrity of these cases so that we get them right. I mean, the last thing we want to do is botch a case um, or lose a case potentially because we have discredited our witnesses because we've released footage or we've released witness statements or we've released, you know, forensic evidence. I mean, all of that is to me viewed really the same way. Um, it comes down to, I think, again, setting the correct expectation with the community and then, and then honoring that commitment uh, you know, in terms of timetable with these investigations. Sheriff, the NAACP and several black pastors are calling for a citizens review board to review police shootings and accusations of excessive force. You know, I asked a number of our viewers also to reach out to us with questions that they would like for us to ask of you. And we had several come back specifically about a citizens review board. In fact, we know that there's one in New York, a civilian complaint review board. And, and, and this, this, you know, viewer writes, if it works in New York City, why can't we have something like that here in Jacksonville? So two, two facets here. I've heard a lot of different things, and you'd have, you really have to define um, exactly what that means. I've heard people talking about uh, civilian review as it relates to uh, the arrest of officers. I mean, that, that, is a, that is a process that really already takes place. If an officer's arrested, that civilian review at some point will be the jury that he sits in front of. And so uh, to shift to administrative cases, every state has different laws as it relates to you know, the administrative investigations of police officers, where ultimately uh, the, the most that can happen is the officer's terminated. So um, we have a law here that requires that all those investigations be confidential, a state law. When I say here, I mean the state of Florida. All those investigations are confidential until the end. And so we do a lot of work to make sure that information at the end of that case, every detail of it is public record at the end of the case. 
Um, so uh, I've been asked, can people review those cases after the fact? Again, absolutely, the data is there and it, it's all public record. So um, every state is going to have different laws that impacts that, and that's why the decisions uh, in Florida but Sheriff, are made do you, the way they are. Do, do, you, do you understand why the public is concerned? Because you basically have law enforcement police supervisors who are specifically reviewing the actions and perhaps, in some cases, if it's founded, the, you know, the problems associated with a police officer involved shooting in which that officer did something wrong, why they feel it's important to have public input in that? Uh, I do, but you're mixing two issues. So, and you talk about police shootings, that's a criminal investigation on that police officer, and that's conducted the same way any criminal investigation is conducted on anybody in the community. There are no additional protections for the police officer during that criminal part of the investigation. The administrative review, when we talk about that, again, that's did he violate policy? The determination has already been made if he violated the law or not. Uh, and if, if he did, he's indicted and that process moves forward. If he did not, he's cleared by the state attorney. And then we, we can begin the administrative review of did he violate our policy uh, in terms of this, uh, whatever the incident is, where, whether it's a shooting or a rudeness complaint. And so uh, I think in that process, again, that's covered by state law, the important thing for us is to make sure at the points where we can be transparent uh, because of current law that, that we do that. And then at the end of these cases, all of that information is available to the community. So you can look back and say, we don't like the way this process went and, and challenge, you know, in the case of an administrative review, challenge us. In the case of a decision made by the state attorney, challenge the state attorney's office on what that decision is. But these cases are not confidential forever. It's just during the process. So I think what you're seeing here is a, a lack of trust in the system. And so we all have to work hard to make sure that we're putting the right information out but they were working every day to build, to build trust. It's really hard to build trust in a crisis. I've said that over and over again, and we've worked hard every day uh, before this crisis, since the first day I was elected sheriff, to make sure we're working to try to build trust in the community, and we'll continue to do that. But, but all of this really boils down to a lack of trust in the community, and, and we all have to work on that. And we, we do want to delve into that in just a little bit of, about the perception from the community. But yesterday, public defender Charlie Kofer joined us, and he said that members of the black community believe that they are policed differently, stopped for minor violations that are rarely issued in other parts of the city. And I want to bring up an example of a ProPublica series that was called Walking While Black. It was found that blacks were nearly three times as likely as whites to be ticketed for a pedestrian violation that residents of the city's three poorest zip codes were six times as likely to receive a pedestrian citation as people living in the city's other 34 more affluent zip codes. So what is the point of that kind of aggressive enforcement, specifically in minority communities, especially when, when we do talk about this whole trust and relationship? So, you know, we, we had a lot of discussion about that, uh, about that topic when those articles were being written uh, years ago, and there's a lot, of way to anal a lot of ways to analyze data. And as we looked into it, you know, overall in the city, um, we were issuing about 35 to 40 percent of our pedestrian citations, you know, went to the African American community, which is just a little bit higher than the than the population. And I think when you see that, obviously you got to dig in and look at those issues. You know, one of the things that we discovered is uh, while percentages look high, we we have a city of a million people, we have almost 1,800 police officers, and we wrote basically one pedestrian citation a day. And so th there's a lot of, of explanation. Uh, that goes into those kind of things. And I think you, you have to dig in, and we did. And so uh, we'll continue to have conversations with the community about issues like that. Uh, when those questions are raised, uh, I don't think you'll see anybody or have anybody say that they, they, while we may not always agree, we'll always sit at the table and have discussions about, uh, about those conversations when they occur. Sheriff, what constitutes in terms of policy resisting arrest and how an officer is allowed based on policy to respond to resisting arrest? So, you know, resisting arrest can be uh, really active or passive. I mean, any, any you know, there's a, and when I say active or passive, any, any you could think of, uh, those are the definitions, what you would, you know, when you would think about that, it's just that. You can actively fight with an officer or you can just say, I'm not, I refuse to be arrested. And uh, at that point, the officer has uh, a set of rules that he goes by in terms of uh, only using the amount of force necessary to overcome the resistance. I mean, that's the simplest way to put it. Uh, and that's the benchmark by which we look at uh, the, the uh, response of the officer. So um, all of that is, is evaluated. Um, the situation is evaluated. And every one of those is different. Um, uh, you'll hear me say many times, you have to look at all of these things 
on a case-by-case -case basis because they're also different. There's so many factors that weigh in, and, and that's what we do, again, as we're conducting the internal review of whether or not the officer violated policy, and that's what the state attorney's office does is they look to see that the officer violate the law actually in his use of force uh, in the community. And I think that the concern is, of course, because, you know, as we know with George Floyd, the officers there, you know, said that George Floyd was resisting arrest. He's on his face. His hands are, are you know, bound behind his back and three officers are sitting on top of him. Is, is there something in the training manual that, that says that local JSO officers cannot respond that way to resisting arrest, people who are resisting arrest? Uh, absolutely. In every training manual around the country, you have that. Um, so uh, what happened in Minnesota was not a failure of training. Uh, it was not a, a guy a, you know, misapplying a tactic. I, I don't know what that was he was doing. I've never seen it before. I've been a police officer almost 30 years. I've been in a lot of training environments uh, and been responsible for training uh, many, many years of that in my career. I've never seen that before in my life. So um, you know, that was just a murder. And so uh, he doesn't represent us. That doesn't represent our training. Um, and as we look at these things around the country, it's good to have that conversation. But, but I, I appreciate what you did. Let's bring it back to Jacksonville and talk about, you know, what happens here and do, is that something that, that we do here? We would tolerate here. And the answer is absolutely not. But we have a very robust training program here. We've had lots of conversation with members of our community long before these last two weeks about what that training program looks like. We allow members of the community to go experience part of that you know, part of the training at our police academy so they get to see and see that perspective of, a, a, of an officer and a recruit as they go through the training. So again, we think the more conversation we can have with the community, the more we're at the table during these conversations, the more we can work to build, you know, trust on it. And it's a day-to-day -day effort. It's not, you never really arrive and say, okay, hey, we've, we've here, we've done enough meetings, we've built trust with the community. It's not how it works. It's like building any relationship. You gotta work on it every single day. So what about community policing? You know, I know you have sensitivity and, and diversity training. How much of the budget actually goes to this type of service really to bridge that gap? Understanding that we all have bias and perception, and as I mentioned, relationship is so important. So what does that entail as far as your community policing approaches? So, and uh, community policing is an approach, like you just said, I think it's, it's not really a class. It's not really a, uh, a group of officers that, that do that. I think it started like that years ago. But community policing is a concept. And if you think about what that means, uh, you're going to get a million different definitions. But to me, it means this. It means that you're open to have conversations with the community. You're partnering with the community. It, this is not an us and them operation between law enforcement and the community. We, we are members of the community. So we've got to make sure that we embed that in our young officers as they come up through the ranks, as they, as they work through our training program and then come up through the ranks. Um, because at the end of the day, we can't be successful if we're not partnering with, with our community. When we have challenges, crime challenges in the community, the, the, the neighborhoods in our city where we're most successful is where we have the best relationships with our, with our community. And so, we, you know, we've got to continue to work on that. So in terms of community policing, that, that is the concept that we embed through everything we do here at JSO, and, and many agencies around the country uh, do that as well. Sheriff, based on just video that we have certainly seen, and, and you know, you've been doing this a long time, I've been doing this a long time, you know, the, the, the reality is, is that the concerns really come back to de-escalation, right? So, so when police are called and they're responding, they're responding to someone's worst day, someone who is angry, uh, someone who is, is upset, someone who is panicked, maybe someone who is mentally ill. Isn't it the officer's job when they arrive? And I know it is a dangerous position. No one is taking that away from what we appreciate every day that these men and women do right. to protect us. But is it not their job that when they arrive to de-escalate the situation? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think you, you, and if you talk to any officer, they would much prefer someone, uh, and I can speak from my experience, if we could talk someone into the back of the police car, we would much rather do that uh, than have to use any physical force. Because anytime you do that, there's an opportunity for you to get hurt, your partner to get hurt, obviously the individual you're dealing with to get hurt. Uh, and that's not the goal. You know, the goal is to solve whatever problem is that we've been there, you know, called there, at least to solve it for that moment. Uh, and sometimes that means, you know, someone gets arrested. And so, uh, yes, but de-escalation is, is embedded through all of our, through all of our training. And, and, you know, it's, a, it's just, it's smart. It's not something that you have to uh, convince officers that they need to do. It's intuitively smart that you want to de-escalate those situations. You won't last long in this career if you're not doing that. And so 
Uh, again, that it's embedded in everything that we do, and, and the short answer to your question is absolutely, you know, we want that to happen in every case. Now, Sheriff, it, and we want to kind of leave it here, and I want you to listen and think about um, what Ben Frazier with the Northside Coalition um, asked us to ask you today. So there have been several surveys, two JCCI surveys, found that 88% of African Americans do not feel JSO police officers treat them fairly. And then there's a third out of UNF that asked the respondents if JSO was courteous and competent. White respondents, 61% felt this way. They strongly agreed with it. 35% of black respondents strongly agreed. That is a big gap. This week, you had a forum, State Attorney Melissa Nelson, the mayor, you, along with other community activists. And in the end, you said in the next few months that you would work on that timetable, one that you have given us in this interview. And I think a lot of people would say that that's progress. But yesterday when I talked to Frazier, he still said that the people at the table, the leaders in this community do not get it. They still feel like their voices are not being heard. So here is another opportunity to appeal to our community. What would you say to about their concerns and progress moving forward to feel like everyone's heard, everyone is at the table and everyone's voice matters. So I, here's my commitment to that. I can tell you that from the first day I was elected sheriff, there's not an activist in this community, uh, a, a group, especially civil rights organizations like the NAACP, SCLC, Urban League. Uh, my door has always been open and always will be. Uh, I think that's incredibly important as we talk about uh, even more so today. I mean, again, we've been doing it, but this is not, uh, I didn't say that for a pat on the back that we've been doing it. We're doing it because I believe that's the way that you, you know, that you serve the community. And so we're going to continue to do it. And, and we'll always have people at the table and always listen uh, and, and have these discussions. That's what's going to make us better as a law enforcement agency. It's going to make our community safer as we partner with communities to, to work on crime issues. And, and we will always continue to, to, uh, to do that as long as I'm sheriff. And Sheriff, we've listened to the public. It's why we've invited you and so many other city leaders here on the morning show to talk about what, what has been a very divisive issue. And, and we appreciate your time this morning. We get to a lot longer, I think, than you expected. Uh, but you know what? We had all these questions come in from our viewers and we wanted sure. to make sure to get them answered. So we appreciate you for being here. And we, we welcome you back to continue this discussion as we know you and others are going to move forward to try to make these changes. And we'll certainly hold you accountable for it. You know that. Absolutely. But thanks, and thanks for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thank you.